Hey, it's Mark and Andy from the Antique Wireless Association, and we're about an hour away from starting the 2019 Bruce Kelly 1929 Memorial Cuso Contest. Andy's built uh, a couple transmitters, I guess three transmitters, and uh, Andy, uh, what do you have? Okay, well, we'll start over here with this transmitter here. Um, so this is a, a replica of the transmitter that was in the September 1924 QST. It's kind of the oldest oldest thing we'll be running today. Um, it was designed to be essentially, you didn't have any money, so you had to make most things yourself. Um, so you had to buy a tube, that was $8. A um, couple other parts you had to buy, but you made you made all the, all the coils, you made all the capacitors, uh, you made this, which is a, believe it or not, a giant uh, plate choke. Um, they didn't have ferrite back in those days, so you used a lot of wire. Um, and you couldn't afford meters, so you, you scrounged meters from old automotive supply for testing batteries and things like that. Mm. So that's, that's how this thing works. Um, in fact, you made the uh, output condenser, if you want to see that, uh, for, the, for tuning the antenna is actually just two pieces of roofing tin and some glass. Mm. Um, you slide that in and out till you get maximum power transfer, you get the impedance match, and away you go, mm. hopefully. Um, so that's, that's what this one is. Um, and, what, and what circuit style is this? So this is a Hartley oscillator. Now look, it looks funny because you're not used to seeing these pancake coils, but that's all it is, just a coil round, round in a spiral fashion. Uh -huh. What's interesting is somebody coming out of the old pre-World War I spark days would immediately recognize this as a miniature version of an oscillation coil or something like that. So mm -hmm. uh, and if you built broadcast receivers from that era, you would also you, you would often use spiderweb coils if you open up a Crossley uh, a receiver off. Sure, of it's a, way, a good way to keep your Q fairly high on the coil. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it, it's okay. Um, it needs more wire than a cylindrical coil, but the materials were readily available. You could use cardboard and paraffin, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, cheap materials. All you need to do is scrounge the wire yeah. from a junkyard or something. So how much power would this put out? Um, we've got it hooked up now. So this is a five watt tube. Um, we're going to be running this conservatively uh, because it's a hundred year old vacuum uh, at about 350 volts. Um, we'll get about two, two to three watts transferred to the antenna. Uh -huh. um, in the day, they ran, you know, 600. I've seen a thousand, you know, reports of a thousand volts being run on this little tube, cool. um, with varying degrees of success. But we're gonna we're gonna keep it within the original ratings now, mm -hmm. um, and hopefully the tube's gonna last the evening. Yeah. And so you've also got a uh, 40 meter tra uh, transmitter too, then. Yeah, we got a 40 meter transmitter right over here. Um, you can see the filament's been lit on this. We were just tuning this up. Uh, again, this is a this is a Hartley oscillator. Uh, we've got two pieces of, uh, of of glass up here that are acting are holding the coil. You've got the the uh, tank coil here, and this is just the antenna coupling coil going out to the antenna. So you so you adjust the uh, the antenna coupling just by sliding that yeah, coil back and forth. Yeah, you just move this back and forth. Um, you can also do it by putting a series condenser in here. Oftentimes you'll see that, uh -huh. so you have a coil and a condenser. Sometimes you can get a little better impedance match, but we just actually choose the taps on the coil. I happen to have one the right size, so right. I'm using the whole coil. Well, the, you, you're keeping a lot of balls in the air because you adjust your antenna coupling, you're also adjusting your tuning on That's this. That's right. So if you look at this thing, if you want to adjust this, uh -huh. um, just the tuning controls, um, you can use as much or as little of this coil as you want. So you have the, the plate, the grid, and the ground tap on a Hartley. You can move the, this around quite a bit. Um, obviously, you can, you can use more or less inductance, so your L to C ratio can change here. Um, you can change this, uh, the coupling to the antenna, as well as how much, you know, so that distance. It turns out that affects a lot of things. That affects the tuning because you're loading the oscillator mm -hmm. when you do that, so your frequency will move. Um, you're gonna, the amount of power coupled. And also there's, you know, there's, there's some feedback. I mean, there's not any shielding here, so you'll get buzzes and things like that right. in certain, certain combinations. So it's yeah. a real juggling act to get it good. Yeah, and it does have quite a distinctive note. We'll hear that later on when you fire it up. Yeah. yeah. So what else do you have? Okay, well over here we have an 80 meter version of this. And we've actually got a real 1920s tube in this. So the, the one you just saw actually has a around World War II, that area. This is the earlier version of it. Uh, the main uh, couple differences, this is, a, this, is a, this is a UV203A. In fact, it's this very, not this very tube, but this, this tube came out um, in 1924. And uh, it was, uh, this is actually the tube that was used in the first uh, transatlantic contact uh, by amateurs, uh, cool. actually late 1923. Um, there's a picture of the transmitter, I think, in the, the January or, se or February, September, uh, or uh, January or February 24 QST. 
It shows four of these. And I believe the AWA actually did a recreation of this. Mm -hmm. a picture of Ed Gable holding the transmitter in one of the old, uh, one of the old journals. Um, again, pretty much the same idea. Uh, more, you know, bigger inductance for 80 meters. Um, some of the parts in this one are not 1920s. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's some certain, you know, World War II era caps and stuff. That's really just a safety thing. I don't want to blow, blow up a capacitor. But we're using a really old tube. That tuning condenser is from, uh, from 1924 or 1925. Mm -hmm. um, works pretty much the same way. Um, you know, just get the, get the taps in the right place and it'll, it'll do its thing. Very good, Andy. Uh, I'll let you guys get back to uh, setting this up, and uh, we'll be listening for you on the air. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Yeah, that was good. So I was about to sneak out the door, Andy, and I see actually there is one more transmitter here, and it's a, just a, a work of art. What do you have here? So this is, uh, this is actually the first transmitter I really built. Um, now, we're not using it today um, because we had a hard time getting it to match the antenna and, and with a with a with enough power and a good enough sound. Uh, so we're not going to run this today. I'll probably run this next weekend from my house. Um, so this is a pair of UV202, same, same tube we're using on 160. Um, they're wired in parallel, and this is for 80 meters. Um, everything in this I designed to be either available in 1924 or be a construction practice that was published in 1924. Mm. So the tubes are available in 1924. The homemade uh, plate and grid condensers here um, were published uh, I believe in radio magazine of that year. Um, the grid; these are grid chokes because you got two tubes in parallel. You get parasitic problems. So these are these are the kind of thing you would do to have um, uh, to, to suppress that. They didn't have carbon comp resistors back then, so you could. It was hard to put one on the plate. Um, so this is what they did. Um, and then down here there are national DX uh, condensers for the tank capacitor and then the antenna output here. Uh, so this is the this is the antenna coupling uh, condenser over here. Um, the coil. This is the style of low loss construction, which they low loss was all the rage in 1924. So, yeah, they would do crazy things like you know with the coils, you know, glass going down the middle because it's one of the best dielectrics they had back then. Probably still is. Um, so they were they were you know getting everything away from the board and that kind of thing. This typifies that style. Um, and I can spin it around here. You can see the front of it. You know, I tried to tried to make a panel kind of in the, in the vertical style that you saw yeah. in the early 20s. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah, so you know you have you got filament, uh, plate current, and then uh, your antenna coupling, which is very optimistic okay. with a three amp meter there. Um, which you know if you ran enough voltage on there, you could probably get an you know a low uh, low impedance antenna. You know a good antenna system back then might have a might have an input impedance of 15 ohms. Mm -hmm. So you you could actually get a lot of RF current out of these. And uh, you know radios of this period, transmitters of this period were they were driven around a regulation. Yeah. Uh, the, you know in the teens they'd use spark gap transmitters, but the they were just a, a big hog on the bandwidth. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, this, these radios came about because you, uh, at the time, amateurs were really required to clean up their signal quite a bit, weren't they? Yeah, there's actually two events that happened. So in 1924, so, uh, cert, some regulations uh, went, into, went into play. Um, but uh, 1929, which is where this contest comes from, there were certain requirements of your transfer. A big one was that you had to have what they called loose coupling to an antenna. It was never entirely clear exactly what that meant, but in general, what, what people interpreted it to mean was, if you have a tank inductance here, this is where the RF current circulates, and this is where, what determines your frequency. To transfer antenna, power to the antenna, you had to have an air gap, all right? So you had to use inductive coupling uh, to, to, to get there. Um, and so this typifies that kind of construction. Now, People did that before then as well, but they the part of the problem they had is when you conductively coupled, you could get other parasitic oscillations, for example, in the AM broadcast band that really bothered your neighbors. They determined this was one way to kind of cut down on some of that thumping and that interference that happened at the broadcast band. It actually made a pretty big difference. Um, and uh, kind of from then on, that was pretty typical of how you would couple, uh, couple to an antenna, mm -hmm. uh, would be to use just an inductive, a variable inductive coupling. Well, that's great. Neat stuff, Andy. Um, I'll be listening for you on the air, and uh, good luck. Yeah, look forward to it. You can stop the oscillator. No, it didn't. That's how it works, right? Yeah. Here, I'm going to break. Go back up to tw uh, where we're going to be, because I really want to tune up there. Because it will make a difference. 
like, like somewhere like, in there. Uh, one thirteen. Yeah, it's good. Mm -hmm. 